So hello and welcome everyone, wherever you are. Um, I know that we have participants joining us from around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, as we begin our session today, it would be wonderful for us to know who's joining us and, and from where. So I invite you to use the chat function to please share with us the location and perhaps also the organization you're coming from so that we can build a little bit more of the community that we're seeking to support today. So welcome to Inquahe Talks. Um, this is a series of webinars where we aim to connect our membership with the broader international um, higher education and quality assurance community to discuss today's pressing issues. We bring together international experts and practitioners to share insights, challenges, best practices, and propose solutions to ensure that higher education and quality assurance continues to serve at their best our increasingly interconnected communities. Um, if you are not yet familiar with our agency, Inquahe is the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education. We're a worldwide association of over 300 organizations active in the theory and practice of quality assurance. And Inquahe offers members many services, including a journal, a bulletin, a query service, funding for projects, and funding for a professional qualification in quality assurance. We also have the newly established International Standards and Guidelines for Tertiary Education and Quality Assurance. These are our ISGs, which we offer agencies as a guide to reflect on their practices. And we also offer evaluation services and a registry of globally recognized agencies yeah, that are aligned with standards and, and benchmarks, standards and guidelines. Um, in bringing these Inguahe talks to you, it's our great pleasure to cooperate with our stakeholders in order to bring re uh, regional or topical focus. And this webinar has been co-organized with the Global Student Network, and we thank them for their collaborative engagement throughout the preparations for this session. And it, uh, it truly has been a pleasure. Um, so my name is Mary Catherine Lennon. I'm an Inguahe board member, as well as being the head of research, international and special projects at post-secondary education Quality Assessment Board in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm affiliated with um, University of Toronto's Centre for Canadian and International Higher Education. So today it's my great pleasure to chair this session uh, for Inquahe Talks titled Building a Global Culture of Quality, the Role of Students in Quality Assurance. We recognize that student voices are critical in shaping higher education and that this, um, this goal is gaining momentum and rippling around the world. And, student, and the struggles to meaningfully engage and integrate students into already existing processes is no fault, small feat, um, but it is an important endeavor as the active engagement of students in higher education quality assurance is attributed to promoting dialogue between institutions and students, underpinning the validity and reliability of the quality assurance review process and providing fundamental or proving fundamental to improving education. So hence quality assurance agencies and educational leaders are incorporating more and more opportunities for students to have their say in what and how education is provided. And we're pleased to have a range of panelists to present the issues to you today. And the insights and expertise of four wonderful speakers we have with us. Um, we have Durfal Owen, who is at the University College London in the UK, who's going to take a few minutes to review historical foundations leading up to current practices in student engaging in quality assurance. Then from, uh, from New Zealand and also the, the Global Student Forum is Ellen Dixon, who is gonna provide us some insights into regions developing and enhancing quality uh, student engagement activities in external quality insurance, highlighting the value of participation from all voices. Then we have Oria Onita, who is of the um, European Student Union, who is going to take a few minutes to showcase the activities of the region as a leader in student engagement in external quality assurance practices. And we'll then hear from Joe Van Green of Western Grown, pardon me, of Western University in Ontario, Canada, who will provide examples of student engagement within institutional processes. So 
Now, before handing it over to our esteemed panel, I have just a few words of housekeeping. Uh, we have muted all of your mics to help with the smooth running of the event and your cameras have also been disabled, but we're very keen to hear from you. These are indeed intended as interactive webinars. So you can use the Q&A function and the chat function to ask questions and inform discussion at any time. And we, in which we might take as we go along or we might hold on to for the dedicated quality or Q&A session at the, after the presentations. Um, also, the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available for free after the event. So now I will pass the mic over to Derfel to lead us from past to present issues in student engagement in quality assurance. Now, how are we feeling about the, um, the PowerPoint situation? Are we operational? I asked Derfel and I asked the Secretariat as well. Let's give it a go, um, shall we? Okay. Um, just to give uh, colleagues some context to that. Um, I'm actually on holiday um, at the moment and I had a crisis decision to make this morning. Was I going to get to the airport early in plenty of time and do my presentation from there? Or was I going to stay at home and potentially miss my aeroplane by trying to commute afterwards? I took the former option. So I'm in the airport lounge um, at the moment presenting um, and having to do it on my iPad because I couldn't get an update to work on my laptop. So this is going to work, right? Um, uh, as a game So I'm sure it was. Um, a few words uh, of background from me. So as Mary said, I work at University College London. Um, I've been there some eight years um, doing various uh, roles, most recently Director of Change and Improvement, but previously have worked in student services, student registry roles. Um, I've worked at the University of Exeter and the UK Quality Assurance Agency before that. Um, my time, my career in higher education, I spent almost all of my career in higher education, has been entirely focused on students' experience, student engagement, student voice, and empowering and making sure that universities are as student-centric as possible. Um, I was working at the Quality Assurance Agency in the UK when they decided to roll out the um, full implementation of student members on review panels and to play a, a stronger leadership role in the higher education sector of drawing students more closely and more tightly uh, into quality assurance systems. So it's a great pleasure for me to have an opportunity to talk to a community as broad um, and as worldwide as this. And I'm really looking forward to sharing some reflections. So here we go. Let's see if this works. I should be broadcasting my screen. Can we now see PowerPoint slides? A nod from Mary. And can you now see it as though I'm presenting? Mary, I can see your face, so that's, uh, and you're smiling, so that's positive. Okay, uh, a walk through inspiring innovation student engagement. So Mary asked me to give some, a little bit of historical context um, to some of this, because I think a number of colleagues around the room will be thinking about student engagement as though it is a, a new and innovative thing um, to involve in our universities. And actually what I want to step for you is that student voice and student engagement is nothing new in higher education and in the university sector. First question I would ask you. Sorry, Drupal, I'm just going to jump in to ask if you could just speak a little bit louder. It's a little bit muffled from background noise. So if you could just speak speak up a little bit, that would be Yeah, helpful. sure. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I, I had a headset, um, but it doesn't work on my head. <laughs> and so on, so I'm, I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, okay, good. Um, first question is, I don't expect you to answer this, but uh, which of these is the odd one out? Um, and I'll explain to you, none of them is the odd one out of these photos, because they all tell something about the history of student engagement and student voice in higher education. First photo um, on there was of a philosopher called Libanius. And he was hanging out in Greece at the same time as Aristotle and Plato. He wasn't a great philosopher in his own right, but he was a fantastic chronicler of society at that time. And at the time, he talked about the education system that existed in, uh, in, in Greece. Um, and what existed wasn't established universities like we have now, but actually you had communities, individual philosophers who would have followers. So students would turn up with wheelbarrows full of gold and would say to a philosopher, oh, please, dear Lebanius, for example, can I please spend five or six years basking in your luminous magnificence so I can learn from you? And that was education at the time. What you started to observe and what was being chronicled at the time uh, by Lebanius was even then students started self-organising. 
So students would start going from one philosopher to another, telling them, well, I have this wheelbarrow of gold. What will you give me for this wheelbarrow of gold? What sort of education can I expect from you? And started to demand different uh, outcomes from their philosophers. They also had a contractual relationship uh, with their philosophers. So if the student or the student's parent was unhappy with the education they had received, they could put the philosopher on public trial. So the students, even as far back then, were very empowered members um, of those communities and were already starting to self-organise. Then if we jump forward a few hundred years to 1215, and that's when the University of Bologna was first established, which is Europe's first constitutionally properly established university. Now that university wasn't set up by a group of philosophers or a community of academics. That university was set up by students. Its constitution, its charter was written by students. The reason for that being is a number of students were moving around different parts of the world and had arrived in different city-states uh, at the time they were studying together. But because they had come from outside the city-state, they didn't have any rights. The only way they could have any rights was by having some organisation that they belonged to. So they established the University of Bologna as a community of students. So that was a situation where the first university ever established was created by students, run by students, in the interests of students. So the very beginning of higher education was student engagement and student voice. Then you move on and have a couple of further examples. So in 1389, the University of Orléans in France was set up and St Andrews University in Scotland. And those were established in a slightly different dynamic. Those were co-owned. Those were communities of academics and students working together to co-establish uh, universities and constitutional ownership between them. And then the pistols that you saw the photo I had was looking to the 1800s in the United States, where we first started seeing the establishment of charters and honour codes. Once again, there's some disputes between different universities around who had the first honour code, but the most credible claim is the University of William, uh, William and Mary. And their honour code and charter was set up because there was a lot of alcohol had started making its way into universities and there was a lot of misbehaviour amongst the student body. And the students were the people who stood up and said, enough, we don't want this sort of behaviour, we want a more respectful community. So the students themselves established an honour code around how they were going to behave, how they were going to engage with each other and how they were going to engage with our academic community in universities. Um, so you might ask why I'm telling the world of this. And the reason I'm setting it all out is because the level of engagement from students in higher education has been there from the outset. It isn't a new innovation. In fact, if you look historically, students have been much more in the driving seat of setting standards and creating the levels of engagement and sort of um, society that they want in their universities throughout the history of higher education. So what I would ask us to think about is that we're not discovering and innovating something new, we are rediscovering something very important to the foundations of university education. Those of you who are interested can read more about that in my book. Um, so I'll skip forward and talk a little bit more about the levels of engagement and the nature of engagement that we start to see in universities um, now, because of course it's all important for us to revisit those foundational values of universities, but of course we're operating in a very different context now to what we were in those different, uh, different centuries. We've had massification, education, some aspects of commercialization and marketization, the globalization of education, um, student bodies being much more transient and fluid than they were before. There are lots of different ways in which I think we need to be engaging our students. The first level is engaging our students as monitors. And that's where we have a one-way discussion with our students. And what I mean by this are those sorts of initiatives such as broad brush surveys where we will engage with students at programme or institutional level, gather their feedback, take some data from them about the quality of their experience, their perceptions of course in the programme, take their feedback and take action on the basis of it. And sometimes we'll, um, we'll give them feedback about action that we take. But it's very much the university, the uh, academic leadership of the organisation in the driving seat and making those decisions, hearing from our students, but nonetheless, they're only monitoring their experience. They're not in the driving seat. Then you might have students at rapporteur. And this is where you go a step above um, that gathering feedback and data from students and actually invite students in to observe that decision making that's happening. And this will be examples where we might include students on governing bodies, university senates or academic boards and councils to hear student voice and there'll be committees and so on that exist. And we'll create places for students. 
But what we're actually doing is being a little bit more transparent and giving students the opportunity to observe and to be a rapporteur to report back to students on what's happening in the university. We didn't quite reach in that level where um, we are giving, putting students in the driving seat and making some of the decisions to change themselves. But it's a very important level for transparency and accountability. The next level up is where we are engaging the students as an expert. And this is where we have students as full participants in decision making. And this is where they're present and contributing to all important decisions, whether they're strategic or operational. So that's the we might have formal places for students to make decision making bodies, but we will also have empowered student communities, whether they are through student associations or students' unions, having that full authority and voice in a place to self organize, to make really important contributions to decision making, um, but also having that stronger steering strategy for the institution. And final level is partner. And this is where we have students not just being involved in making decisions, but partners in delivery as well. This is where they have full involvement, not just in the decisions, but actually taking responsibility for action and assisting with delivery as well. I'll talk a bit more about um, uh, some of this. So those two first levels are some of the typical historical practice and the emerging approaches that we know where we are putting students now, taking students back to that level that I was talking about earlier in historical context, where students are ex-partners in shaping and delivering change in their organisations. Why would I talk about engaging students as experts? Well, that's because I think students are the only people in any organisation who can tell us what it's really like to be a student now. So we're building on those existing structures to make sure that we are engaging and involving students, providing full training and induction for them, supporting them to conduct research, develop their own initiatives and write proposals for change and giving them shared control of the agenda. So students aren't just responding to somebody else's agenda when they're engaging with us. They're actually being given an opportunity to present their own views and ideas, and even sometimes to chair and lead some of those committees. And the partnership approach is where we've been engaging them, as I said, but there's a key difference, which is empowering students to implement decisions and collaborating as a community of partners. At UCL, we've got a number of different ways in which we engage uh, with this. We have our umbrella, which is change making, but we involve students in a number of different ways. And we do this because we recognise we want students involved in everything, in all aspects of quality assurance and enhancement. But we also recognise that different kinds of students will want to engage in different things, they'll have different um, ideas. So we have a student representation system. We have over 1,500 elected student representatives who are present at module, program, departmental, academic department level across the university, helping to shape and make decisions and be those advocates and champions for the student voice. And that's a very broad uh, engagement tool. We also have a student panel that meets regularly. So we have students that are sounding board. So there's a place where we can go and hear student views and different ideas. We also have student quality reviews. They undertake two roles for us. When a new program, module um, is proposed in the university we will engage students and students will have an opportunity to pour through that program and make recommendations and suggestions if i'm honest our student quality reviewers in that context are probably the most active thorough and challenging uh, throughout the process it's an absolute pleasure to have them involved we also when we conduct our internal periodic departmental reviews we will have students as quality reviewers um, engaged in that process Finally, we'll have students as reviewers of teaching practice, um, and this is our replacement for peer observation and peer dialogue, where we will recruit and engage students to provide feedback, to, to sit in a lecture theatre or a seminar, observing the teaching practice that's going on in the room, and giving students that, uh, giving lecturers direct feedback about how they felt that experience um, worked for them. And sort of taking that peer observation to a different level. So historically, we would have two, one lecturer observing another lecturer, we're now inviting students into that process with the students to give that feedback. It's been incredibly powerful um, as a tool uh, to take it. One of the challenges sometimes we face with some of this is that uh, different communities of students feel um, more able to engage than others. So we've taken the decision, first of all, to provide full support and training and recruitment for students in the process. But also we pay our students to be involved in every um, single one of these levels apart from student representation because there's so many of them and the requirement to engage is much lower but if you're involved in any of the other levels that's quite a significant commitment that they're inviting the students to make so we pay them um, for their time to take part in that so what i'd ask and leave you with is this health check um, if you have a look at those different four levels of engagement 
are you engaging with students? Are you thinking as broadly as possible about different ways of engaging and involving students? Have you maxed out the opportunities for student-led change in your universities? And you can work through some of those, perhaps with some of your colleagues uh, in different contexts to see how you can take it forward. So that's the end of my slideshow. I hope that's worked. It did. Were you it able was, to it hear was... me all the way through? We we did. We had some background noise, but um, but the slides were excellent, and we were absolutely able to to capture everything that you were that you were trying to share with us. So so thank you so much for that. Um, if you don't mind, just stop screen sharing. Then um, that's great. Thank you so much, Jerfel. Really interesting, and and I appreciated the historical background that really sort of sets the stage as to how students have been involved previously and and how we're beginning to, to bring them back in um, more more consistently today. So now I am going to pass the uh, the mic over to Ellen who is going to share with us a little bit about some of the activities of the uh, the Global Student Federation. So thank you. Thank you Ellen. so much Mary Kath. I wanted to also thank Dirk for, for that wonderful presentation. I wish that we could start all engagement with higher education institutions, and I can see Horia nodding as well with that type of a presentation, because I think that sums up student engagement so incredibly well in the ecosystem of the university. Um, so it leads in also very nicely to my topic that I'm going to share with you today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. So my topic today is global trends in student engagement in QA, but firstly, let me say uh, a big thank you to our host, Mary Catherine and the wider Nkwahe Network for inviting me to speak on the behalf of the Global Student Forum in this very important conversation. Coming from largely a quality background throughout my seven years on and off in the student movement, it is a pleasure to support this essential conversation on students' global engagement with QA and to hear the interventions from the other speakers. But firstly, I'd like to introduce you to our organization. The Global Student Forum is the umbrella organization for 203 democratically elected student organizations from 122 different countries. It was founded in 2019 from the solidarity of the All Africa Students' Union, the Commonwealth Students' Association, the European Students' Union, shout out to Horia, uh, the Organizing Bureau of European School Students' Unions and the Latin American and Caribbean Students' Union. We defend the educational, cultural, economic and social interests of more than 300 million learners worldwide in decision making spaces of the international community. One of our areas we engage in is governance and governance is a quality education, the cluster which I specifically run for the Global Student Forum. Quality and QA has evolved across the last few decades in higher education. We all know that well. This has largely been argued to occur due to the impact of globalization and the massification of higher education due to the intersectionality of the state, policymakers related to the state, and the institutions of higher education themselves. From this, we have seen the evolution of small quality agencies that originated post-World War II to overarching national or regional quality frameworks with varying degrees of state input and control, and with increasing input from supranational bodies and UN organs. There are a number of arguments as to why quality and QA have evolved in this particular form, with the major arguments being the increase in global demand with support from policymakers for skilled human labour impacting degree frameworks and the need for new programmes, the rapid growth of higher education institutions in partnership with private institutions such as cross-border franchising and distance learning, and the competitive force of the market itself impacting students' programme interests. All of this has remained relevant has to remain relevant to both localization and internationalization of higher education at the same time. Such then requires the difficulty of finding and regulating standards and pedagogy content and design for higher education that can fit to both contexts, which is largely mediated through QA agencies and sometimes the state and supranational bodies. As a consequence, QA is not really singular, but largely evolutionary. It is built on cycles of integration of ideas from research, practice, and case analyses, educational environmental contexts such as process and outcome, which may or may not even be linked to QA systems, and focuses on the continual improvement of student learning through accountability. From my engagement in quality, I also acknowledge the important facet that many quality processes also focus on university student partnerships, as Dufour showed very well. 
This sometimes happens directly where quality contemplates the level of student input into an internal quality process and therefore begs the question, what role do students play in the ecosystem of the university itself? Or alternatively, it can happen with the external quality process, such as the creation of student guides or the execution of auditing, monitoring and evaluation. Partnerships between higher education institutions, governments and students have significantly increased as quality and QA processes have been professionalised. These days it's almost impossible to go to any end of the world and not hear Dewey's student-centred learning model that appears to have been adopted or is being encouraged to be adopted into most policy tools relating to higher education. It is not difficult to see the relevance of the student in this process. As you can see in the diagram, Students are not one dimensional stakeholders within HEIs. They provide diverse input as participants, partners, experts, informants, creators, consultants, and researchers. This can occur at any stage of the quality process to both advisory boards and bodies, whether it be during the planning, development, approval, or monitoring of an education program. Student engagement is also seen to occur in both internal and external quality. Internal factors could be things such as motivation, level of knowledge of quality, teamwork, organization, analyses, for example, while the external can include specific activities such as the establishment of a student council or a seat on an academic board, departmental work in the monitoring of quality and support to the wider administration and faculty. While we are largely aware as individuals as to the relevance students have and why they engage in QA, we often do not really talk fully about the models of this type of engagement. A colleague of my national union worked with the Academic Quality Agency, and I can see their lead Sheila is, is watching this, so shout out to you Sheila, um, in my nation a few years ago, to highlight how students engagement and quality may differ depending on the model chosen. He identified three different models that are typically used across the globe, including student voice, student engagement and student partnership. Often these terms are considered synonymous, but they are not. Student voice, according to the Higher Education Authority in Ireland, endorses opportunities can be provided by student engagement to take the form of student voice, where students can offer an opinion, but they must rely on others to take on board their views. The model is considered not always effective in this way as it presumes that student representatives have access to resources, training and support to deliver their views, which in regions such as Africa and Latin America is not always the case. Furthermore, it suggests there is a singular body, which does not always suit regions like where I'm from, where strong tribalism means that one voice may not always be appropriate. Student engagement has been a recent popular policy tool that is described by INSTEP, also in Ireland, as an investment of time, effort, and other relevant resources by students and their institutions to support the student experience and the institution's reputation. This is a two-way process between staff and students, ranging from a variety of activities from learning and teaching to student engagement with institutional structures, processes, and strategies. But then we come to student partnership the final form proposed, which is considered, in, in my opinion, the most effective. Wales provides a description of partnership, differentiating it from voice and engagement by saying, you can engage students and listen to their voice with a survey, but working in partnership with students would mean giving them the opportunity to input what they think the survey should be asking in the first place, ensuring you feed the results back to them after the survey is finished and involving students in any of the actions resulting from the feedback. Sparks then points to the value of partnership and enhancement where students do not only help identify ways that they can carry out that enhancement, but help facilitate implementation where possible. Some such examples of really interesting agreements moving through these different forms are actually below, which you can see in these slides. But you can also take note that they have a largely Western orientation, which we will get back to. While there is an ecosystem for institutional engagement and quality and QA, it's also clear that there is an interrelated system for students. What I have drawn up here is a rather rough and a little bit rudimentary diagram of what the student movement engages with in quality from the local level through to the global level and the types of engagement we have with varying institutions and bodies. And I apologize, it is not a fantastic overview because it's much more detailed than that, but it's a start. The system starts at the class representative level. The grassroots level where you have students put over their courses to talk with staff and their student association or union about relevant student interests. 
This then feeds back into the local body's academic group who discuss it with committees and boards who can take this to the quality team at their national union. Typically, their national union is involved in quality processes at the national level, such as the training of student auditors or student engagement on overarching academic committees, and then feeds into the regional student representative bodies and QA, led by their regional engagement. These take to the supranational bodies sometimes, the points of interest that they are looking at, but typically work with the intergovernmental bodies such as the European Union or the African Union on topics such as student mobility, and can then feed into the global body, us, the GSF, who are able to provide overarching statements on quality to bodies such as Nkwahe or UNESCO. But it's clear from the information provided that student engagement and quality also differs between regions. My job is to connect with all of these regions and work out thematic similarities and differences between them as each regional student union continues to work towards a stronger global quality structure. It is helpful that collective documents like the 2019 Global Convention on the Recognition of Qualifications Concerning Higher Education has been recently released uh, and entered into the force um, that was put together by UNESCO, um, demonstrates that you know, global and regional strategies of across-border quality are inher inherently, like increasingly becoming popular. But we must weigh that against the fact that current quality assessment is very, very much a Western origin in a decolonizing world and has an inconsistent level of student input depending on politics and resourcing. The three groups that you see here are the ones that I work with the most with in QA at the global level. Before I start at the African system for student engagement and quality, I want to jump to the European system. While my colleague Audio will be covering this in much greater depth than I ever could, I want to start by highlighting that it is no surprise that the location of some of the oldest universities and wealthiest nations in Europe were the first to enforce student engagement and quality at HEIs. ESU has a QA pool that consists of 73 members uh, from the EHEA countries that is involved with the IEP Steering Committee and the European Quality Assurance Forum. I will not go into detail on this, Hordia will do that shortly, but it is no surprise to me that where student representation is legislated by the European Union, quality engagement among students is incredibly strong. Africa, in comparison, has not largely included student engagement and quality in accordance with our colleagues in ASU. Um, our colleagues there have recently put together the creation of a pool of student QA experts in accordance with the Continental Education Strategy for Africa that calls for joint or cooperative ventures to promote quality assurance, mobility and exchange in higher education. ASU is proposing post-training for national and regional quality agency bodies with students to work uh, with the Pan-Africa Quality Assurance and Accreditation Framework. They aim to do this through the question of student quality networks, capacity building with HEIs and quality assurance on their domestic campuses, and promoting student engagement and QA processes through committees and boards. In the Asia Pacific, student engagement is also inconsistent. In Asia, QA is increasing in popularity. For HEIs engaging regularly with quality structures, students are typically involved in the internal procedures but are less likely to be included in external review processes. Those involved in external reviews may not be recognized due to inconsistent engagement and student representation across Asian universities in general. Students are still considered valuable to the quality process though. Despite this, in both Asia and the Pacific, there can sometimes also be periods of civil unrest simply due for the failure to be fully included in QA processes among students, as it has a bit of an impact on the legitimacy of their degrees in some contexts. In the context of the Pacific, a number of the ministers of education basically um, met in a recent event to discuss the future of education for the region and tried to work out a definition or a structure for quality um, that would be able to address some of the differences between tribal contexts in the region. Student voices are strong in terms of like input to QA processes in both New Zealand and Australia, but intersectionality and in the tribalism of the Pacific Islands, um, in addition to New Zealand, can sometimes mean that um, processes for student input can be difficult to represent a multiplicity of voices. Students and academics involved are increasingly moving towards the need for an intersectional definition of quality from a community perspective to suit an Indigenous population who need to be respected regarding the innate values of cultures across engagement in higher education to aid decolonization. I want to summarize this presentation with an important quote, which is ironically from Audrey Hepburn. 
It reminds us what the point of quality in education is. Hepburn says a quality education has the power to transform in a single generation, provide stu students or children or students um, who are largely youth in this case, um, with the protections they need from the hazards of poverty, labour exploitation and disease, and give them the knowledge, skills and confidence to reach their full potential. This is why it is essential to involve students in quality. Firstly, because quality is clearly linked to inclusion, decolonization and equity purposes, as well as the value of a degree relevant to the social construction of our societies as a whole. Secondly, because the quality of education does not singularly link to the success of an HEI, but also the potential of the students themselves to be active actors in our society. Quality, therefore, is not simply the creation of quality processes, but the creation of quality people to support our future generations. So thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. It's been an absolute privilege to be able to share with you. And I turn back to Mary Catherine. Thank you so much, Alan. That was a really interesting presentation and fabulous to hear about the different models that are used in the various jurisdictions around the world. So that was very insightful. And, and I suspect we'll have some, some questions and comments coming from the floor when, when we get to our Q&A period. Um, and now we have the opportunity to hear from Aurea, who's going to go a little bit deeper into the European experience. So building off of what Alan just shared with us. So, um, so Ori, I feel like you're okay to share your own slides. You, you have that capacity? Fabulous. Okay, well, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and, um, and share your presentation with us. Great, thank you very much. Just one second to make sure that this works. And I'm indeed able to share my screen. One second. It Can you like confirm? Yes, you're good. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the for the invitation. We are really happy to contribute to the webinar and we were very happy to, to receive the, the invitation because not only we are working on this topic and for sure we believe it is uh, essential, but also we do not have that many opportunities to understand the differences between uh, between our, our contexts and how they shape our understanding of student participation in quality assurance, but even at broader level, our understandings of Aurea, I'm very sorry. We're having some we're having some great connection problems here. Okay. Um, and the voice the, the the voice is also a little bit funny. Do you have earphones or something that you could perhaps use that might? might yes. Um, let me let me try. Let me try one second. Okay. Thank you. A apologies to participants. If it, uh, I'm sure you can appreciate that technology is a beast unto itself, and we're never really sh quite sure how how these live sessions are going to uh, are going to unfold so thank you for understanding and patience can you hear me better now um perhaps Maybe we can maybe we can continue. Uh, okay, hopefully hopefully it will get better. So oh yeah, now it's now it sounds better. That's great. Yeah, Thank perfect, you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much again, and sorry for the for the issue. Um, so coming back, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for for inviting us. Of course, we are we are working a lot on the on the topic, but we do feel the need for better understanding of different contexts and how student participation in quality assurance is shaped by the context, by the understanding of what quality means, of what student participation means. And uh, I believe we have heard a very interesting presentation so far about firstly the historical context and secondly the, the global context of, of student participation in, in QA and student participation in, in general. And in this session I will uh, delve a bit deeper into the European understanding. So in both uh, how we do understand the student participation in general and how this understanding shapes how students are engaged in quality assurance processes based on a very specific development 
because uh, in, in the European uh, higher education area, we are not talking about the national context. We are neither talking about an intergovernmental binding context as there is no legislation for uh, for determining the minimum level or the, the criteria for uh, engaging and involving students in, in quality assurance. But across the years, and we will see later in the European higher education area, we have had a very specific understanding and uh, specific commitments on how uh, member states understand that students should be involved in, in quality assurance. I'm Horia Onita, I'm Vice President of ESU, the European Students' Union. I'm coming from uh, Romania originally. I also uh, am happy to see a very important uh, Romanian participation in the in the uh, list of attendees. And right now I'm, I'm living in Belgium uh, and I'm serving as Vice President of ESU and from last week also President-elect of, of, of ESU for the, for the next mandate. Very briefly about uh, ESU, uh, it is the European uh, organization representing students across, uh, across Europe. Uh, our outreach is um, composed of, of 40 countries. We represent 20 million students through our 45 National Union of Students. Uh, quality assurance is our one of our four, four main pillars together with social dimension, with internationalization and mobility and with uh, governance and, fi uh, and financing of higher education. And it has been probably one of the areas where we have uh, had the most concrete developments and shared commitments and understanding at, uh, at European level. Here you can see uh, very briefly our list of uh, membership, uh, which is not uh, synonymous or parallel with the European Union, but rather with a, a larger European higher education area um, spanning from, from Portugal to Israel to from, from Norway to, to Malta all over, all over Europe. I would start with, uh, with a general uh, understanding in the European context of the importance of student representation, because the specific commitment and understanding of how we engage and involve and become partners, as, as, as Alan provided a very useful uh, differentiation, all, all of this understanding have an amped context on how we do see the student representation in higher education in general, based on our own understanding of the mission of higher education and of quality in general, because we cannot define our expectancies on how students should be engaged in quality assurance without priorly defining where do we want to go, what, what is what we want to achieve and how we understand the more general context of, of student participation. And uh, at least now we are also working in the Bologna process on a statement on defining the va fundamental value of student participation. And we have seen that across Europe, there are specific elements that are seen across, uh, across levels. So we believe that students should engage and should be a full part of the decision making bodies in higher education because they are a core stakeholder of higher education system. This is the, the more uh, consensualist approach of, of uh, engaging in the leadership and in the decision-making processes of the uh, higher education institutions, the, all the stakeholders within the, the system. We also see that they uh, would maintain the co-ownership of the education system and Alan already presented uh, that across uh, the globe we see the concept of student-centered learning. We have tried uh, very much to, to have our own definition of how this is implemented across policies at European level, national level, and institutional level. And also because in our own understanding, the quality of education is linked intrinsically with the idea of student participation. Because if we define the quality of education by achieving the missions of, of education to preparing students for active citizenship, for society, for a uh, labor market, for all the relevant transitions that are happening in the world, then we must agree that uh, student participation is key, is essential to that, as we see the transversal skills that need to be, need to be, uh, um, that students need to be equipped with. And also, not only that, we see student participation also as a key element for preparing students towards democracy, towards autonomy, and towards responsibility. 
and this responsibility of, of being uh, responsible for for your own learning is basically another uh, another uh, rationale for the genital student part, uh, representation and this has been translated also in how we understand the student participation in in quality assurance here we are taking a definition from mania clemencic um, now a researcher previously an SO director who sees the concept of student participation as a student agency in three layers. We have the, the student participation and the student agency within the learning and teaching processes, uh, seeing uh, or being seen as the interaction between the students and the, and the teacher. We see the student participation or student agency within the learning environment and how the learning environment should be shaped uh, by, by the needs of students. And here we have topics like universal design and other issues that come, come to, to be discussed. And we have the more uh, meta understanding of a student agency within the environment, within the, not, not the learning environment, but the higher education institution environment. And in order to achieve this kind of idea of student agency, especially in the, in the first and the second layers, we do need uh, student participation in, in quality assurance. Regarding the, the per, going, going further, we have the, our, our understanding and how we define uh, quality of education, then we need to see what quality assurance is for. And of course, afterwards, student participation will, will be shaped also by this understanding. And here we have the results of the Bologna with Student Eyes, which is our flagship publication, uh, collecting information, both factual data and perception-based information from our uh, 45 National Union of Students across Europe. And right now we are actually working on a new, on a new document, an anniversary Bologna with Student Eyes publication uh, 20 years after the first uh, edition. And uh, this is the, the last, result from 2020 where we see what NES is believed should be the most important purposes of, of quality assurance with the enhancing of uh, study conditions and the provision of information and transparency as the two main uh, selected uh, options. Again, basically in order to ensure this kind of uh, the goals, student participation in quality assurance is not only uh, not only brings the, the added value, but it, it is essential because you cannot have the, the information needed to act without the, the full student engagement. We also uh, talked before, and it was a very interesting uh, presentation. We, we have uh, our uh, idea of how we define the ladder of student representation irrespective of whether we use it generally speaking in, in higher education context or if we use it for, uh, for specifically for quality assurance uh, processes. And we do have a legislation in uh, the majority of member states in the European higher education area talking about uh, student participation in QA. However, as I'm going to present also in the challenges part, we see that the tokenism is one of the uh, one of the most uh, important problems because uh, student participation doesn't mean only having students as a decoration or uh, putting students because it is required, but having a profound understanding of the of how processes should be uh, changed in order to ensure uh, full uh, student participation and student partnership. partnership. That means having the, the, the rules and regulations and procedures that students can initiate proposals. They have the resources to uh, make, uh, to, to see that, uh, that, that initiatives uh, in practice being implemented and also having the possibility to decide how resources are allocated, uh, bearing in mind different priorities. So here uh, we, we codified in a way these, uh, these uh, uh, principles in our own student rights charter. And we have also published different, uh, different uh, uh, analyses of what's happening across Europe, either uh, by ourselves, for example, uh, the student participation innovation practice, practice guide. And uh, of course, uh, the, the slides will be shared and uh, you will uh, have access uh, via the link to the document, or we have been part in, in a project for uh, a general guide for effective stakeholder involvement in quality assurance. And I see many representatives here of Parachis, which uh, has, uh, has led the, the publication. Regarding the, the student involvement in internal quality assurance, which is the backbone of, 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 uh, in, of quality student participation in quality assurance in general, uh, here we have created some own standards and, uh, and guidelines uh, based on uh, what we have agreed in the European fora. 
as we have the European standards and guidelines for quality assurance, I'm sure that uh, most of participants are already aware of, of this document prepared by E4, uh, the, a cooperation among education stakeholders in higher education, including higher education uh, institution uh, organizations, EUA and Eurasia, and uh, the, the Organization for uh, Quality Assurance Agencies, ENQA, and ESU as the fourth, uh, fourth member. And we do have some specific standards of how students should be engaged. And from these standards, we as ESU have built, have built also our own policy. So for example, uh, also Alan presented the idea of, of student engagement through, through surveys. We have also went further uh, as it was presented on using qualitative means, but also seeing the impact of, uh, of student participation in internal, in internal quality assurance, because we can name the processes in different ways across the globe. We can see uh, different, different policies in place, but at the end of the day, what is actually important is that students see a meaningful impact of their contribution and of, of the leadership processes. And in many countries across Europe, even though we would see, or we would believe that there is a very developed system, we do have many specific policies on ensuring student participation, but we see that students complain that they are at the table of decisions, but they see, see this as a tokenistic process, that it, it is, it is uh, organized. There are several uh, internal quality assurance uh, processes cycles, but they do not, do not see that specific impact that, that they are uh, expecting. And uh, the, the first issue here, and we have uh, surveyed our National Union of Students this year, is actually that 60% of them uh, argued that uh, even the, the results of the evaluation of quality by students are, are not published. So that's, of course, a very, a very clear sign that, uh, that, is a, that there may be a lack of, of follow-up. And also, uh, we see student participation as, as, a, as consultants, but also in, in quality assurance bodies within uh, the whole quality assurance uh, policy cycle. So from the preparation of the strategy plans through the evaluation of, of, of them and the monitoring. And we do see usually students in the final stage of deciding because they have formal voting powers in the senates of the of the uh, universities, etc. But we do not see this kind of engagement in the preparation phase or in the follow up phase. As, as mentioned, we do have a document, the European Standards and Guidelines, that uh, um, regulate in a way or, or at least uh, define the, our shared understanding of how uh, student-centered learning should be promoted. And within these uh, European Standards and Guidelines, either directly in some standards or indirectly through the, through the guidelines, we see the student participation as a common transversal, transversal topic. Regarding the barriers of student participation in quality assurance processes, we, we are monitoring this data for 20 years already, and we keep doing that in order to see the, the main barriers. And right now, from these barriers, we can also draw the solutions. Firstly, we see that the National Union of Students argue that the, the main barrier is the lack of information about quality assurance. And here is the issue of not seeing students only as input, because if we want to ensure that students are partners along the way, we need to ensure that they have access to, to information and to, uh, to the relevance, to the uh, steps and, and the outcomes of the processes, which us usually is lacking. Also, another, another topic that is uh, usually mentioned is the lack of uh, recognition of, uh, of uh, student participation in QA. I was very happy to hear before the idea of, of uh, even uh, paying students for, uh, be, for, for that time being engaged in quality assurance, in internal quality assurance. That's unfortunately not a common practice across Europe. In some uh, instances, there are, for example, uh, uh, regulations on flexibility, for example, um, skipping lectures, moving exams, et cetera. But we do not see, uh, we do not see that kind of uh, support uh, that, that would actually enable students from a diverse range of backgrounds, of social economic backgrounds, to take part in, uh, in in quality assurance. And of course, there are so many other uh, other barriers, but they have uh, less than less than around half of, of NES is answering to to them. And also, we we see that student centered learning. Uh, is the key principle towards, uh, towards supporting or, or linking the idea of, of student participation. And uh, here we see that uh, basically for, for more than 40% of NESs, they see that the 
indicators on student-centered learning are uh, not prioritized or are, they are seen, seen uh, below average or they are not prioritized at all when internal quality assurance uh, methodologies are, are designed. Going now to, to the European level, we have a very specific uh, system of ensuring student participation. So firstly, we, we do have regulation on uh, student participation in external quality assurance. So uh, for in, in, in this case, we again rely on the European standards and guidelines, which are not a binding document, but uh, they have specific consequences if member states do not implement, uh, implement the, the document. And student participation is seen mainly in, in two lens. First is uh, it's student participation in external QA, in external reviews. And in this case, we have policies on ensuring that uh, students are equal members of the panels. They are equally paid. They are trained generally. So as all panel members, but also have the opportunity to have a specific training as student experts. And also they have the possibility to be secretary or chairs of external uh, panels for quality assurance. So uh, as, as ESU and through our QA pool, we do look into, this, uh, into these policies and see whether they are, they are implemented. And secondly, we see the idea of, uh, of uh, student participation in QA bodies. And here we have a very strong cooperation with uh, with ENQA and with the uh, QA member QA agencies, uh, member of of ENQA on ensuring that students uh, are are full members of the different uh, decision making or consultative bodies of the QA agencies. So these are the two main uh, main uh, uh, tools for prom promoting uh, student participation in external quality assurance. And of course, uh, this is also uh, monitored through the evaluation of. Uh, QA agencies in order for them to become ENQA full members and uh, registered in the European Quality Assurance Register. We do see uh, that we have different uh, different experiences across Europe. Uh, what we promote is that uh, there is a student expert QA body at European level co-managed by the QA agency and the National Union of Students. We see that that's happening in some countries across Europe, but not in all. So we strongly promote the idea of co-ownership of student expert pools and student trainers being trained at national level to take part in external QA reviews, but also to serve as experts in quality at their own uh, institutions. And uh, usually, as we can see, this has been in place mainly in Eastern Europe now, while uh, in, in Western Europe, we see some, some lagging uh, practices in this direction. Shortly about okay, the... Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to have to just jump in here for a moment, Aurea. We're, we're, we're running it slightly behind schedule. Um, and I know that I know that the European example situation is robust and there's so much to share. Um, but I wonder if we might pause your, your presentation for now and, and move to Jovan, who can tell us a little bit about a, a perhaps less structurally organized system that, that is in Canada. And then I know that there's going to be questions about, about the European situation. So maybe we'll, we'll come back to you in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, sure. That's perfect. That's perfect. I, I didn't have the, the timing uh, here as I not on my laptop because of the connection and sorry for, for taking No, it was very interesting. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. So if we have um, Jovan, are you, are you able to share your own slides? I can, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, okay, Jovan. wonderful. I'll pass it over to you then. Please Super. introduce yourself. Super. Thank you, Mary Catherine. Thank you to, to each of, uh, of my fellow uh, panelists here. Very interesting to learn about each of your contexts, uh, historical, global, uh, European, uh, and all the amazing work that is being done there. The amount of effort and time invested is significant. Um, my name is Jovan uh, Groen. Uh, I'm in the role of Director of Academic Quality and Enhancement uh, at uh, Western University in Ontario, Canada. Um, and um, I've been in this role for several or almost uh, uh, two years now. And before then, I was director of uh, a center for university teaching at the University of Ottawa in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, the capital of Canada. Uh, and so I'm coming uh, at this topic from a, a, an educational development lens. My uh, doctoral training is in education, in participatory evaluation. Um, and that has helped inform, I think, um, how I approach this work. So the example that I'll be sharing with you um, 
this morning or this evening or this afternoon, depending on where you are on the globe, um, is very much about an institutional case uh, and how we've tried to apply many of the concepts uh, that you've been hearing about uh, from our colleagues at, at one institution. We're always learning and growing. Um, and we've had some successes and, and many challenges, and we're trying to continue to learn from those, particularly moving uh, up the levels of engagement. As Derfel was presenting initially, uh, you know, from monitoring to being involved to being a partner, uh, Ellen had an example of that with uh, uh, student voice, student engagement, and student partnership. We're trying to move into more complex forms of student involvement. Uh, Oria was even speaking about student engagement, uh, and we're, it's a new term to me in terms of its, its, its concept, but we're, it sounds like we're trying to move towards the second and third levels of student engage, uh, agency as he was presenting them. So uh, on the slide that you'll see, just a little bit of context about the institution that we're implementing some of these strategies in. Um, Western uh, University in Ontario uh, is, is in a city called London uh, uh, that mimics a little bit uh, uh, London, England. Um, we're a medium-sized institution with about 11 faculties, faculties of medicine, dentistry, engineering, business, education, these types. Um, we have about 42,000 students. This means that it boils down to about 250 uh, uh, programs that we bundle together that are evaluated uh, and are reviewed as part of our quality assurance processes. There are many manifestations and modular configurations and combinations within those programs, but we tend to bundle them as part of our, our, our review process. We also have several other institutions under our umbrella, that is to say um, three affiliated university colleges. And while they have their own independent boards of governors, their academic decisions go through the Senate um, at Western University, which means that quality assurance falls under um, that, that area. So we evaluate those programs as well. Um, governed by a provincial entity that looks at, uh, uh, that produces a quality assurance framework and guides the process for all publicly funded universities within the province, we have many components that are consistent as we review our programs. Because we have about 250 programs at Western, that means about 30 are reviewed in every year because they're on a seven to eight year cycle moving ahead. So these are programs like chemical engineering, English writing, French studies, theater studies, family medicine, a broad scope of programs. Um, and so they go up for review and participate in, in several components. The first of which is a, a self-study. And so they do a, a, an examination and taking stock of where they're at and where they would like to go uh, as a program. That's almost about a year. Then there is a site visit where there are external disciplinary experts that are invited in to, to weigh in and they visit to the campus, the site and have meetings with all the relevant partners in the program. Then after that, they produce a report uh, with recommendations. The program has a chance to respond to those recommendations, proposed actions moving forward, timelines, who will be responsible. And the faculty responds back as well particularly around resourcing of those recommendations. And finally, it goes through the Senate subcommittees uh, for evaluation review. And then there's an ultimate um, decision about the recommendations moving ahead. And then the most important part is the actioning and implementation of those recommendations uh, as the program continue continues in their enhancement cycle. So there are multiple spots where students can be involved in, in those um, along that track of about a year and a half of that review process that happens every seven, eight years for every program. This slide here kind of demonstrates a little bit the spectrum of engagement, if you were to look at it that way, that some programs uh, have little engagement, if we look at the left side of that spectrum, and some have very robust engagement as we see on the right side of that spectrum. So our role at the Office of Academic Quality and Enhancement is to support programs to be in that more robust configuration here. Um, that isn't to say they might do one of those things, it would mean that they may do many of those things in different, in different contexts for their program. So sometimes there are programs with very little engagement, some will involve students in surveys and focus groups, 
Almost all programs have uh, students involved in the site visit when the external reviewers come, they'll meet with students. Um, so many programs have students on their curriculum committees. And this is a situation where on the committee that is running the self-study, they may help then design the very survey that is then administered with students, as Ellen was indicating in one of her examples. Um, students may also be involved in curriculum mapping. So rather than just map the intended curriculum, they can map the experienced curriculum through the perceptions of students as they're participating. Um, they may also co-author parts of those self-study documents, which can be, you know, 50 to 100 pages in length, and students may have a component specifically within that document. And then lastly, they may partner in the actioning of the very recommendations that emerge from the process. So over the last few years, what we've been um, aiming to implement is using a, a, a framework very similar to the levels of engagement that each of my colleagues have presented. And we take this framework and we share it with each of the programs that are up for review. In preparation for each of their review, we share this framework adapted from Healy and Healy and students as partners scholarship. And we say, what aspects of your review fit in each of these categories. Maybe there are parts of your review where students are serving as informants or consultants. Maybe they're participating in surveys or focus groups and they're sharing their opinion uh, or their perceptions of their experience. Um, where are they involved in processes? As an example, maybe they're participating in the retreats that are helping create uh, program level learning outcomes or revise those outcomes or participating in retreats that um, culminate in curriculum mapping as an example. Where are they partnering uh, uh, in this review process? Perhaps they are full members of the curriculum committee and maybe they are panelists on the site visit at the same level as the external experts that are brought in. This is a theme that I'm gonna come back to in one moment. And then lastly, where might they control a part of this exercise? As an example, maybe a student association within a program may be responsible for implementing one full uh, outcome or recommendation from uh, the, the review process itself. So back to that one point about students as reviewers uh, on the same panel uh, as the external reviewers at the site visit. So you remember when we were looking at the very components of a program review, we had the self-study, then we had the site visit, then we had responses to the external report, and then the actioning. Uh, uh, process. Well, when that site visit occurs and we bring those external experts from anywhere in the globe to campus, um, we've started hosting a panel of ex expert reviewers and each expert's in their own right. So we have two expert disciplinarians. Then we have an internal reviewer who is a faculty member who is a host, really, is an expert in the context of the university guiding the process. And then we have uh, a student reviewer now in the last uh, a number of years participating uh, to make sure that the student experience is center in the conversation uh, and uh, uh, the interviews and the meetings that take place over the course of the site visit. So really the commitment on behalf of a, a student reviewer is in order to, to act in that role, to participate in a quality academy, that's what QA means, a quality assurance academy retreat. So they have training to prepare themselves to be a student reviewer. Then they'll review the documents just like everyone else on that site visit panel. Then they'll uh, participate in the visit itself, comment perhaps on the report, which is genuinely authored by the external reviewers, but they have a role to comment on that. And then they'll write a written reflection on the, the, the items they've learned uh, as they've moved ahead. So the Quality Assurance Academy prepares the students to participate, really brings them up to speed on what, what is quality assurance in the, in the framework of post-secondary institutions within Ontario, our provincial sort of context within the, the rules and regulations that exist here. What is the purpose of it? Um, what is the internal governance structure within the institution and why does it work that way? Uh, how did it become uh, in essence? How are programs developed? How are they then reviewed? Uh, then we talk about why we have students on these uh, panels and why they're so important, what they're bringing to the table and the level of experience that they have and expertise that they can share. Uh, we talked about the contributions they can make. They learn from one another because we have undergraduate students, 
graduate students from all across the institution participating. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we try to frame this as best we can in how they can develop from this experience as well. So what leadership skills are they developing? Um, what university service work can they then demonstrate on their CV? Uh, as several of my colleagues were mentioning, uh, we do pay our students who participate in this. If they play a role as a student reviewer, they're paid to do so, which exemplifies and recognizes the importance of that work. And then they can demonstrate it on their CV um, in the same vein. So we have petitioned uh, uh, with our senior leadership in the institution to be able to fund these opportunities, uh, which isn't a great amount, but nonetheless an important one. Um, the last slide I have is merely a, a, a selection of questions that students have brought to many of these conversations that are just so important and valuable. So imagine now uh, you have the leadership of a program, a big program, maybe like a, a Department of Chemistry as an example. They've been running uh, a certain way for, for many decades. In fact, Western University uh, uh, began in 1878, so that was one of the oldest programs. Um, and so you have different members of a review panel asking questions, um, asking the program to reflect in a certain area vision forward and a student is able to bring some of these questions that center the student experience in those reflections and enable a program to think plan and move ahead uh, with that in mind so we're quite proud of our students we're quite proud to learn from our students and we're we're ever evolving in the ways that we're um, involving students in our quality assurance process we have much to learn uh, but we have uh, 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 celebrated a few successes along the way thank you uh, for uh, for your attention and I hope this is this is helpful looking forward to your questions fabulous thank you so much Jovan that was really interesting and I think the um, the the beauty of, of this session has been that we've really delved deep into the on the ground institution program level reviews, which are the backbone of quality assurance processes. But then we've also recognized that that doesn't happen in isolation. It's really part of a larger ecosystem of quality assurance and quality enhancement at the institution, at the quality assurance level that has political implications. And there are a number of bodies, including um, national, regional and global student federations and, and overarching bodies as well as demonstrated by Aurea's conversation and about the European Union and their um, support for engaging students. We, um, we don't currently have any um, Q&As that have come up. Um, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to invite you all to, to have a conversation. Um, I, might, I might just have a little reflection that, that occurred to me as we were going through. One of, the, um, one of the participants in the chat noted that they were going to be taking notes and, and working somehow with AI on this in this recording recording this through ai and it occurred to me that with the rapid rise of artificial intelligence and how it's being used for teaching and learning purposes there really is a, a dramatic change that we're going through and in fact we had um, we had one of these inkway talks about a couple months ago on academic integrity but it occurs to me here in this particular case thinking about students i mean they are probably going to be more informed and more insightful about the role of, of artificial intelligence in the educational process. And so it just seems like such a natural place to, to start those conversations, um, to see students, students as partner. And I think that um, I think that that's, that just creates opportunities already having these structures in place to, to have these conversations. Um, so that was just one, one thought that I had, but please, I see Durfell, you've got something to contribute, please. Yeah, well, I thought I would say something about the things you stimulated us on artificial intelligence, because it's um, uh, like probably everybody on the call where exploring this, discovering it, worrying about it, excited about it in different ways. Um, and one of the most powerful uh, interventions I think we've had at UCL was as ever with our principals, there are no no-go zones for working with students. Our first action was to reach out to students and say, how are you feeling about this? Where do we want to go next? Um, 
And guess what? Our students were as fearful, as worried, and as excited as the rest of us, and generally worried about the same things. Students are also worrying that they're maybe some competitive advantage that other students are getting. They also want to make sure that they are well supported um, to engage with artificial intelligence and they want to know and see that the, the whole academic community is being supported to develop in, in this sort of area. And it's really helped us place on a sound footing where we're, we're not suspicious of each other as a community and how we're using this, but actually we're going to explore it together and come up with solutions together. So um, I think it's a really powerful example of where that student partnership, that student involvement uh, matters and can make a real difference. Yeah, thank you. That it is, it's a real opportunity for, for co-creation. Aurea, you have a, you have your hand up and then we'll go to Ellen. Yes. Now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have just approved, as I saw, a poli our first ever policy on AI last week, and uh, we have uh, we have surveyed uh, the opinion across our NESs based also on the fact that there are so many different approaches. You have uh, universities which uh, look forward on how to integrate AI, and then you have other universities like the Sion Spo is coming to my mind, which banned the use of uh, AI in uh, in the university and for, for preparing for courses. So we have different approaches and I would point out that, yes, we will need more, even more skills to and training to use AI for both students and, and, and teachers and it will for sure have a powerful impact on, on what you need to learn and how you learn. So changing the mindset, even more accelerating the, the change than the digitalization. But some, some very uh, little points. Firstly, we believe that uh, there should not be decision-making procedures based on AI, as we still see biases, especially towards vulnerable groups in the, in the prototypes and paradigms and algorithm. Uh, it is not that the algorithm is, is set to be like this, but on the data that uh, is fed. And uh, we see the added value of AI even in quality assurance and ensuring quality of education through data analytics. But we believe that this cannot and should not replace the real student engagement partnership feedback experience as it cannot and still machines cannot replace that. And finally, on academic integrity, we have unfortunately seen the, the idea that by default students are seen as wrongdoers, as uh, someone who would by default use AI for, for bad purposes. And I think that's a, that's a wrong perspective to look at AI and it's rather how assessment is changed in order to, to cater for how AI can be used, not directly as uh, seeing students as someone who would would use AI in in bad uh, means in order to cheat for exams or etc. We we don't agree with that uh, with that paradigm. That's right. And the more we talk to each other, the more we understand that there's not sort of these polar opposites, and that that no one's trying to to pull one over on anyone. We're all working together. Thank you, Ellen. You have your hand up. I think it's a, a very interesting point that you put forward, Mary Catherine, and I, though I must admit I'd almost got to the point in some of the work that I've been doing where I had to tell people to stop asking me about AI because it was always the first question that was coming up. <laughs> Hori is nodding as well. What is the student perspective on AI? Um, I, I honestly think it's as Durfell has already said, it's mixed. Um, and I think foremost on people's minds is not the exclusion of AI by any means, because students are naturally curious because they're like the whole process of education is integrated with te technological change. We want that technological change. It produces innovation. The question is what innovation is it producing in this context? Um, and I had to ask that recently to um, Texa actually, when they were over from Australia in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I said, with the context of AI, what are we actually looking at when we're looking at originality and creativity? Because clearly AI is challenging the parameters of what that looks like. Is it purely human-based? Can it be machine-based? I mean, when we look at the way that AI has evolved over time, the thinking computers were always theorized to be able to be creative. Um, it was just that at first we weren't using them in that way. And I've heard it compared a lot recently to the scientific calculator when it was introduced into curricula um, in your high schools, uh, where there was this big to-do about the fact that it would be included in mathematics would be a massive issue. And then they found that they simply needed to change the curricula to a adapt to that and in accordance with that students were then able to use the scientific calculator. Um, so I agree with Hordia that we've seen some very mixed approaches in Australia that they completely banned um, any form of digital engagement and examinations and tertiary engagement, um, which means that, you know, 
we're kind of potentially not looking at the the values of AI in this space for we see the values of it for refugee students who may not be able to speak in our context English as a first language easily uh, for students with a disability for example who may need aid of like assessment and writing tools but then we come back to that core element with it's almost the existential crisis that we see higher education in at the moment which is you know with this development of our engagement with private institutions and the ability to further technology in these spaces and we bring bringing this to the Global Digital Compact at the moment within the UN structure with the Summit of the Future coming out within the GSF. What are we seeing as the future of education in general when it comes to engaging with technology? And students are at the forefront of asking for innovation. So really, it's just a, a question of integration in a way that we can do that in a balanced form so that it is able to go into pedagogical styles and curricula because we don't really want to see a repeat of what happened during the pandemic period where educators were pressurized in order to change that we want to see an adaption that's natural so very much in support of what's already been stated here yeah wonderful thank you thank you so much and, and thank you everyone for for um humoring me on that topic because i think it is interesting and i think there's real um real opportunity for increased and in, and in, uh supportive conversations with, with all partners. Um, now I'm gonna to look to our question and answers. We, we've had one and Rafal has been very, um, very graciously working in the background to, to respond to it. But I think it's an interesting question and, and I also appreciated your response. So I'll read the question, Rafal, and then perhaps you can sort of give some commentary and then I'll open it to, to others as well. The question is, what are the best strategies to stimulate students' involvement in QA in cultures where students are not used to making their voices heard? Or they're not used to having um, voice agency. So Jafal, you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a challenge we face internally as well, where we have such a global community of students from different um, cultures and traditions of education studying in one university. You find different students from different backgrounds feel differently about engaging. I think there are a number of things to do. First, I think it's making sure that there is a wide and deep understanding and commitment um, to student partnership. Now, that's, <laughs> that's quite a far reaching thing to say, but that colleagues across the university, the whole of the academic community have a shared view and understanding of what is the role of students in not just being present in the organisation, but in shaping the organisation and the future and giving that open and honest feedback. There are some rudimentary things as well, which is giving students anonymous opportunities to give feedback. That's why when I was talking about my levels of engagement and I talked about monitoring for students, lots of surveys and so on, I didn't mean to su suggest that that was a lesser level. It is a really important tool to gather broad, in-depth views from students. And sometimes students just want to give a little bit of feedback anonymously and hope and they are happy and confident to know that will be taken by somebody else and dealt with um, in, in different contexts. So even those rudimentary things matter. The other thing I think is for people like us who are on this call, who are clearly committed and champions of student engagement, when we see, see students coming forward, be a leader with them, step in and offer as much support as possible uh, as you can, because navigating a university decision-making structure, infl influencing change, Universities generally don't like change. They like to tell everybody else that they need to change the whole of society and innovate and so on, but internally they don't. Now, if you're a student, you're a pretty disempowered individual. So be a leader, see those students, hear them, support them and give them the best advice you can. Wonderful, thank you. I, I think that's great advice. Anyone else want to want to comment on, on that? How to support student student voice? Yeah, please, Jovan. I would just like to echo uh, what my colleague Durfell was saying uh, uh, about the aspect of confidentiality. Um, sometimes we've come to find on the spectrum of ways that people can be engaged, uh, uh, while some are more complex and some are more simplistic, they're all valuable in different ways, in different contexts. Um, some of the richest commentary we've received was when we uh, would have a student association, a student body themselves, uh, invite a larger group of students together over a meal, over a, a, you know some sort of beverage uh, or, or pizza or, 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 or lunch, and uh, they would comment and they would have another student kind of record, uh, anonymously record uh, comments, and they would organize these comments, you know, in terms of a program or an institution's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, or, or, or other 
paradigms here to, to organize or frame those. And, and students seemed to be open, they would build on each other's comments, but because there were no uh, institutional leaders, as in staff members in the room, it was all run by students, there was more of a, a feeling of comfort and safety there, and, and a very rich um, conversation and outcome that was in a way actionable. And in some committees where there is student representation, where decisions were to be made thereafter, uh, they could help see how those would uh, uh, sort of uh, go from there. Uh, and we've seen good success with that. And that sort of speaks a little bit to to, to DeFrell's point where there is an anonymity, I can't say it, anonymity, uh, confidentiality, but a, a support from the leadership to have it student driven. Um, and, and that's, we've seen some success there. Fabulous, thank you. Right, there we go, I'm back on again. Fabulous, thank you. Now we are just at the at the end of our, our session here, but I'd like to, to open it up to each of you. Is there anything that that you just your your final thoughts that you'd like to contribute to uh, to our session today? It really be meaningful. It's certainly been um, eye opening to understand the, the various things that are going on in the different jurisdictions and in the at the different levels. Um, maybe we'll go in the same order we, we started in. So Drafal, maybe you have just a, a closing thought. Um, uh, it's been a really rich discussion. Great to see uh, so much. I think the level of interest, um, the number of participants in quite a short space of time, I think Mary is a testament to you and your organizational skills. So thank you. Um, but also I, I'd, I'd be really excited and keen to see more from Inquahi on this um, in answer to one of the questions that, sorry, I've been bashing away in, uh, offline. I think it'd be really interesting to see a project develop. You know, Could we reach a point where we have some global principles of students engagement? Um, across a piece that would be terrific wonderful yeah I, likewise i've been monitoring the chat and, and the q a and the the interest and engagement and people desiring further engagement on this is is quite um quite exciting so thank you um ellen do you have something to share Absolutely. I firstly want to thank um, Defa Horia and Jovan for your wonderful input in that space. Uh, I also agree that the level of passion is always exciting to see from those who come to quality, who have that understanding of student engagement. I think it's the allyship that we then see between educators and students working together for the betterment of education as a whole. And that's always fantastic to see. And something that I know myself coming from like a QA background is always thrilled by. So this has been um, a wonderful privilege to be part of this conversation. Um, I also agree that the going forward creating some type of overarching standards for student engagement uh, because as Horia has seen we can see that pinballing between the real valuing of student engagement and then occasionally the sort of tokenistic structures that can potentially occur but also uh, because in our, our developing nations they may not necessarily always have the same strength of structures that some of us may be able to take a little bit more for granted. Um, I think also working forward is the definition of quality ongoingly. What does that look like in our future of education, not just here, but for future generations to come. So I think it is always an ongoing conversation. It is never at one moment in time, and it's a pleasure to be able to contribute to this. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Gloria, do you have a, a final thought? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. I'm, I'm very grateful for, for you having started this conversation. And uh, we do not have this kind of, space of spaces of learning from each other at, at a global level. And this is why I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. And yes, I mean, I, I very much support the idea of, of uh, working on, on principles at a global level, but also acknowledging that even at the institutional level, that may not be one size fits all policy, even less at a uh, at global level. However, we do have some things that we all agree, like uh, showing the impact, showing care towards, towards students, offer students examples, uh, bring, bring leadership forward. We all do agree on that. Of course, there are different ways of, of implementing it, but uh, we, we really need these kind of conversations at global level. And I, I hope that we will continue them in, in one way or another. Wonderful, thank you so much. Jovan, over to you. Yeah, I would just, uh, I agree with all of my colleagues uh, and to be able to celebrate the insights that students have to share is a powerful thing. I have to say of all the self-studies we've read, and I've read hundreds of them, the most insightful ones are the ones that have integrated the student reflection on their lived experience 
thoughtfully and in an articulate way. Those are the most powerful ones. And those are the ones that the programs learn from the most and grow the most. In fact, they community build because of it. And I have to say, it's, it's, it's impressive to see it every time. Fabulous. Thank you so much. So, um, so thank you panelists for your valuable contribution to our conversation today. Uh, your depth and breadth of knowledge and expertise and, and, um, and insights into student engagement, student partnerships, students as partners. And uh, um, it really has demonstrated the challenges and successes um, for, for how we can move forward to ensure that the quality of education is enhanced through the integration of student voice. So on behalf of all of you, thank you. Uh, on behalf of Inkohe, thank you very much. And thank you to our participants for your question, questions and comments and also your engagement and desire to, to move forward on this particular content of, uh, of student engagement and also your, in, your interest in engaging with Inkohe. So please do reach out to us on both accounts. We're very happy to, to work with you and to facilitate conversations to move these pieces forward. Our role as, um, as our in, as as an international network is really to support our membership and support the institutions and in, in all partners in quality. And so I think we have a real opportunity here. Um, so finally, I would like to remind you that we'll, we will be hosting the 17th biennial conference at the end of this month. Um, it, it is hosted by the Independent Agency for Quality Assurance and Education, IQAA, um, in Astana, Kazakhstan. And um, the topic is the Roadmap to Enabling Quality in Tertiary Education. So we do hope to see you there. Um, please look up our website to, uh, to register for the event and see the wide range of very interesting topics that will be covered at the, at the session. Um, we do hope to see you then, and we do hope to see you again at our next Inquahe Talks, which we'll be, we'll be sharing the information on shortly. Thank you so much to all. Have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.